Well, hey, thank you all again for being with us this morning. Sorry, it is a bit toasty. Uh, air conditioner is only working at about 50%, so thank the Lord for 50%. Um, if you do need, there are some cold waters right over here. Feel free to get up and grab one, and there's a pitcher of lemonade and some cups. And if you just need to cool off a little bit, there's some beverages there. Uh, please do feel free to do so. I won't be offended if you stand up while I'm talking. All right, uh, Mark chapter 7, if you want to open your Bibles, uh, Bible in the chair in front of you, or it'll be on the screen. We are going through the Gospel of Mark, and we are talking about disciples and discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and how does this look? As a reminder, the Gospel of Mark was written for this purpose, largely. Uh, Mark went to Egypt, essentially, and this Gospel was written to a Gentile audience, a non-Jewish audience, to tell them about who this Jesus was and what it means to be a disciple of his. And so today we look at the second half of Mark chapter 7, and we're going to learn some practical things about what it means to follow Jesus and how we can interact with Jesus in our everyday life. So let's get to it. Uh, there's going to be a few practical lessons at the end, but first uh, we're going to read and then talk about it like usual. So we'll start in verse 24, Mark chapter 7, uh, verse 24 and following. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the little children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the Lord's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There are some, <clears throat> excuse me, there are some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears, and he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Epaptha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were open, his tongue was loose, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. We're going to focus largely on the first of these two stories, but I will address the second. And so the first one starts out, Jesus goes into this area, Tyre, uh, the vicinity of Tyre in this area. And if you know, it's sort of kind of out by the coast, north side of Israel. And this area historically is populated uh, by people who are not Jewish or had issues with Israel in the Old Testament. If you read through the Old Testament, you will see that they were regularly enemies and that now, in the first couple of centuries, a lot of Greek and, and Gentile people live there, non-Jewish people. And so this was sort of a new area. We don't know why Jesus went there. It doesn't necessarily tell us other than he just wanted to get away. Um, but it doesn't work. He gets there and uh, word gets out. And then this woman comes. This woman comes to, to talk to him. And her, her daughter was possessed by an impure spirit. She's suffering in one way, shape, or form. And, and she can't deal with this. And so she goes to Jesus. She's clearly heard all about him and who he is and what he's doing. And the scriptures tell us in verse 26 that she begged Jesus. She didn't just ask if it's convenient, if you have time. She begged him. She begged him. Then Jesus gives this answer that has puzzled a lot of us, if you've read this before, or even Bible scholars for years. We don't, well, let me just talk about this. <laughs> let me reread it. He says to her, first, so I get that you want help, but first let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Okay. This is a little bit confusing for us sometimes, but let me just tell you, this is really offensive. This is basically saying to her, hey, listen, you are a Gentile woman. You are like the dogs. The children need to eat first. I'll help you later. Yeah, it, kind of brutal. <laughs> kind of brutal. Why in the world is Jesus so dismissive and offensive of her or towards her? He says that the children of Israel need to eat first and that the dogs can eat the scraps later. The immediate question I ask myself is, is he calling her a dog or her daughter a dog that needs help from him? And how does this work? What's going on here? 
Now, there's some hope. He says, first, therefore, insinuating that there might be a second, that you guys are coming. Gentiles, you guys are coming, but right now I need to minister to the children of Israel. As we read last week in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that Christ has come for all to be saved, first the Jew and then the Gentile. So maybe he's alluding to this idea that, no, 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 we need to talk to the Jewish people first and then we'll get to the Gentiles. But essentially, what he's saying to this woman is, you know, I get it, your daughter's suffering, but you know what? You need to wait. You need to wait. But let me ask everyone here, how many of you like waiting? (laughs) How many of you, when there's a person you love or care about who is suffering or in pain, accept the response of, you know what, I understand, but just wait? Right, maybe you've taken a, a, a... child to the ER or something like that, or you've been in the ER and someone comes in with a child or someone that is suffering and in pain, and they say, well, you know what? We'll get to you when we get to you. Just please sit down. And then they just lose it, right? No, no, my kid is suffering. My kid's puking. My kid's got 112 degree fever, whatever it might be, and you need to see him now, now, now. Now at the ER, that may or may not happen, but this is what's happening. This woman basically comes and and Jesus rebuffs her. Jesus says something to her that is kind of harsh, rude, and dismissive. But then her reply, verse 28, is amazing. It's witty. It's, it's, it's understanding. It's very sharp. She says, okay, Lord, fine. But there's dogs in the house. And even when the kids are eating, they drop crumbs and scraps, and the dogs still eat while the kids get to eat. And then Jesus says, for such a reply you may go, the demon has left your daughter. What's happening here? Well, I don't know exactly why Jesus said what he said, but I know this, that this woman understood what he was saying. She gets it. She gets it. Here is this Gentile woman, historically from a culture that is an enemy of Israel, and she understands what Jesus is saying. She gets what he's saying. She says, fine, you can call me this, you can consider me second class, you can consider me a Gentile and separate, and maybe, but whatever. But you know what? I'm going to give you a response that shows that I believe that you can still do this here and now. Even if you're telling me to wait, I know you can do this for my daughter here and now. Because even the dogs eat while the kids eat. And he says, okay. For that kind of reply, for that kind of faith, for knowing that you believe I can do this, your daughter will be set free. She knows she's a Gentile. She knows she's an outsider. She knows she might be rejected by this Jesus, this Jewish rabbi. She goes to him in faith, knowing full well, but she doesn't care. She presses Jesus even more, even though his first response was not all that kind. She comes to Jesus with a humble heart, presses him, and follows the desires of her heart to say, no, I'm not going to take no for an answer. And what's amazing is we look at this and we see this in contrast to Mark 6 with, you know, Jesus in his hometown. You remember that story, one chapter before? They don't believe in Jesus. They don't think he can do these things. And so the scriptures actually tell us Jesus couldn't perform any more miracles there because they had no faith. And yet here is this Gentile woman coming in, having faith that challenges Jesus. And what's amazing about her, too, is that she gets it. Everyone else questions Jesus and doesn't understand what he's saying, but she gets it. And Jesus' response to her after she presses him is simple. You know what? Everyone can eat at the table of God. You're right. Your daughter will be made well. Now, there's an issue we need to address, and that's verse 27. Um, Why was he so harsh? This isn't going to sit well with many of us because we always want to have the answers, but we don't know. We don't know if he said it sarcastically. We don't know if he was saying it to test her. We don't know if he was saying it or if it was a common phrase in the time or whatever. You can read all different commentaries, and they'll give lots of different answers if you Google it and look it up. Um, you know, maybe he was testing, maybe it was a gentle tone, all these things. Maybe, as I kind of hinted a little before, maybe he didn't think the Gentiles were his mission and he was just focusing on the Jewish people and didn't think they would have the faith. Honestly, don't know. Scripture does not tell us. And we probably won't ever find out. So, don't worry about it. I know that's not a satisfying answer, but don't worry about why he said what he said. Let's look at what we do know. You know, remember, mystery is okay. Right? It's okay not to have all the answers of every verse in the Bible and know exactly why Jesus said what he said all the time, because you're not going to. So then what do we know about this story? What is the lesson we see from this woman? What can we learn from this woman? Well, the first one was this, and we've talked about it over and over again in life. Come to Jesus with humility. Every single person in Scripture who comes to Jesus with humility finds grace, finds healing, finds freedom. Every single person who comes to Jesus with pride in their heart demanding something gets sent away really sad. 
Now, we can ask Jesus, we can press, we can plead just like this woman did, but there was something about her heart where she knew that Jesus was Lord. And then again, the result. So we have this lesson of coming to Jesus with humility. And then the result of the story, like I said, was healing and freedom. Her daughter is made well. Every single person in the Gospel of Mark, up until chapter 7 here, go back and look, who comes to Jesus with humility in their hearts is healed and given the gift of freedom as disciples of Jesus Christ. Freedom from their sin, freedom from their struggle, freedom from their whatever it was. And this is God's desire for disciples, that when we follow Jesus, we would be freed and healed from all that junk that makes us so miserable. And then what happens next is verse 31 and following, he goes into the Decapolis to this other Greek area full of Gentiles and heals people there too. And they recognize him. Verse 36 and verse 37, they talk about how great he is and they can't stop talking about him. He's healing people. He has done everything well, verse 37. People, Gentiles, are coming to this rabbi, finding healing, finding freedom. And many of the Jews at the time, the Pharisees, couldn't understand and never experienced that same healing and freedom that God desired for them. You know, brothers and sisters in Christ, let me be clear about something. We know, like we talked about last week, we need to focus on Jesus, but we struggle with the how, don't we? How do we do it each and every day? How do we live this out? How, can I, how in the world can, can, can I actually reflect Jesus and walk and talk and act like Jesus because I fail all the time. So I just want to give some practical things. Last week was a bit more kind of impassioned, plea, follow Jesus, love Jesus with everything you have. I want to give more practical points this week. And I have a couple of them. And one of them is sort of a presupposition, but I guess it needs to be said. Um, you need to be talking with God and Jesus. <laughs> a lot of us think that, okay, well, I became a Christian when I was a child and I was baptized or I was confirmed and I go back and forth to church whenever it feels convenient and all of these things and that's fine and I get it. We can't always come to church. It's not about church. But wherever you are with God in your discipleship journey, you need to be talking to God. Period. Part of your daily routine needs to be prayer, needs to be asking God questions, needs to be sitting in quiet. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't have to be three hours every morning before sunrise, but you have to be talking to God. Remember the bleeding woman in Mark chapter 5 who reached out and touched Jesus and was healed? The analogy I gave that everyone was just bumping into Jesus and she reached out and touched him? We need to reach out and touch Jesus each and every day, whatever that looks like. Whatever that looks like. It can be asking questions. It can be sitting in silence. It can be venting. It can be reading scripture. It can be so many things. But if we want to walk, talk, act like Jesus, be his disciples, we need to reach out and touch Jesus daily. It can look different each and every day. It doesn't matter. But you need to be intentional about these things. And no one else can do this for you. It may seem like day one stuff, but you know what? We stink at it, so I'm going to keep focusing on it. I can buy you a devotional book, but you've got to read it. I can give you a Bible. But by the way, if you want a Bible, take the one in the chair in front of you. I don't care. Take it home. Give it to your neighbor. Do whatever you want with it. But you have to read it. Right? Like, no one can force you to be a disciple of Jesus. This is something you need to choose for yourself, and it has to be daily. The second one is it has to be with humility in your heart. Jesus is Lord, you are not. And so if you are coming to Jesus with pride, like he owes you something, like God, you deserve something, like God has to, whatever it might be, it has to be with a humble heart that you go to Jesus and say, Jesus, help. My regular communion with Jesus is not some holy, mega spiritual thing. You know what my regular con communion with Jesus is? God, why? I'll sit there at nighttime out under the stars and I'll just say, God, why are you doing this? God, why is it like this? God, what are you doing here? God, what is happening here? God, help me understand this. That's honestly what my regular daily prayer time is. And then I just sit in silence and think about God. And sometimes I feel like God is speaking to me and sometimes I feel like there's no answer. But each and every day I am trying to reach out to Jesus and I'm trying to do so with a humble heart to know that I'm not God and to try to see what God is doing. So like this woman, she comes to Jesus with a humble heart. And then what did she do? This is the third thing that I think will really help all of our journeys with Jesus. Is we need to know it's okay to press Jesus on what we want. Now, this is different than demanding things with a prideful heart. What I'm saying is look at this woman. She had a desire of her heart that her daughter would be made well. That's a good thing. And she went to Jesus and the first response was, no, you need to wait. And then her response to Jesus was, you know what? Pass. This desire is not going away. I think you can still help me. 
Friends, it's okay to keep asking Jesus for things. It's okay to keep begging for things. It's okay to keep praying for things. How many of us say we're going to pray for something we pray for at one time? <laughs> Friends, pray every single day. If there's a healing you want in your life, if there's a relationship that needs mending, if there's a person that is suffering in one way, shape, or form, and they continue to suffer, don't just stop and pray once. Pray every single day for that person. Put it on a sticky note on your mirror. Put it on the dashboard of your car. Put it somewhere you'll see it every single day and pray for these things each and every day. And if the response isn't what you think, keep pressing. That's okay. If it is on your heart to pray for these things, Keep pressing. It's okay. God can handle your heart. Even if your heart is disappointment, even if your heart has doubt, even if you have questions, God can handle that. Be honest with what's going on inside of you and press Jesus. It's okay to do that. Jesus is alive. Scripture is very, very clear. In Matthew 28, when he leaves, he says, I am with you always. Jesus said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. If you are my disciple, the very presence of God will dwell with you like Jesus came and dwelt among us in John chapter 1. And so if that is true, and Jesus is alive and the Holy Spirit is with us, then we need to know that we can ask, that we can walk and talk and be in relationship with God. So this is the fourth one I want to point out, and that's this, is listen to your heart and keep asking. If there is something that doesn't leave, a desire, a thing, whatever it might be, keep asking for God to help you with it or keep asking for God to heal it. And you may say, well, Sam, last week you said our heart can tempt us and lead us away. Yes, I did. But Scripture also says that our hearts can lead us to great faith and to great miracles. And those miracles don't just bless us, but as we've seen also in the Gospel of Mark, that our faith can help bless other people as well. Maybe you'll get what you're pleading for. Maybe you won't. Maybe your prayer will be answered. Maybe the answer is still wait. I don't know. I've seen it often that people will pray regularly for the desires of their heart, and then God, through the process of discernment, this is what we call discernment, God, through the process of discernment, will say, okay, here's these things that are, you're passionate about are on your heart, and over time, as we pray for them, something goes away, and it's no longer a desire of our heart, and then we're, we're good. Sometimes they never go away. That's okay, too. Friends, we need to ask we need to approach God with humility. We need to press Jesus when something still is on our heart and we still don't have the answer and we still don't know what to do. Ask Jesus. Don't feel like God can't handle it. Don't feel like God can't do it. And do it every single day. I want to share with you a brief story as we wrap up, and that's this. When I was a young pastor in my early 20s, there was uh, some stuff going on where I was pastoring uh, teenagers, and there was this new sort of charismatic Pentecostal church in our area. And a lot of the teenagers were going there because they had these big experiences of God's presence and miracles and, and wonderful, all this stuff. And I remember talking with some people about it, and, and there was a lot of stuff going on. But one of the things I, I remember thinking was, I don't want that big emotional experience. Because what I saw in people was it had to be in this church and in this time and in this place for them to experience the presence of God. You know, one of the ways I think about it is this. I, I didn't want to just experience you know, experience at one time, but I wanted it to be a constant in my life. What does the presence of God look like in my life? See, a lot of times we go to church wanting mystery to be explained, but the reality is, is one of the points of worship is that we would experience the mystery of God. And, a, and someone gave me very good advice. I was saying, basically, how do I experience the Holy Spirit? I don't know what this looks like. And they said, well, pray for it. And I prayed for it once and said, I didn't, nothing happened. And they said, no, no, no. You got to do it every day. And you got to do it for a long time. And spend every morning before you start your day with a simple prayer. Lord, show me the power of your spirit today that I would witness what you're doing in this world. Or God, show me your Holy Spirit. Show me what you're, whatever it was. But every single morning I would pray, sometimes just a minute, that I would see miracles, that I would see God working, that I would see these things. And what happened was actually kind of amazing. One, God answered that prayer, shockingly. But um, two things happened. One was that the Word came alive. The Holy Spirit became evident in my life through how much I fell in love with this book. And that's one of the main experiences that led me to want to go to seminary and study this book more. But then the second thing was much more personal, and I'll spare you some of the details, but I'll tell you this. There was a time, it was the middle of the night, I was out skateboarding, and because I couldn't sleep, and I used to live just skateboarding around on quiet streets when there's no cars. And I'm out skateboarding, and something happened, and there was this huge kind of intimate experience of the Holy Spirit. And I can't explain what happened, but I can tell you the exact same 
the exact spot it happened and what I was thinking and feeling. And I knew then and there that this stuff was real, that the Spirit of God was living and active, and that it was powerful. And I had been praying for it every single morning for at least eight, ten months, just to feel something. And it hasn't been a constant in my life in the sense that, you know, I'm always having these mystical, amazing experiences, but there's been enough along the way through these sorts of things, through pleading and pressing Jesus that I want this to be part of my life that I know it is. And that if this is a desire of my heart that God has blessed me with it. And so for you, think about what it is. What is it that is a desire of your heart that you're tempted to give up on? <laughs> Friends, don't be afraid to push. Don't be afraid to beg. Don't be afraid to plead. And this is the last point is don't limit God. Do not limit God or minimize others to think that they'll never change, to think that it'll never get better, to think that God won't do that thing. Keep asking. It may happen in this life and it may not. But it doesn't mean we stop praying and it doesn't mean we stop asking. Because if it is a desire of your heart that it's there for a reason and God wants you to plead, God wants you to ask, God wants you to acknowledge that it is a desire of your heart. Press in like this woman. Walk and talk with God daily, even if it's just starting each and every day with, God, help me with this. God, help me see this. Help me with patience. Help me with faith. Help me with whatever. Beg, plead, be honest. Listen to your heart and keep listening because it's there for a reason. Brothers and sisters in Christ, do not limit God or what God can do. It may happen. It may not. But one of the things we learn about walking and talking with Jesus is that we need to be laid bare before him with everything inside of our hearts. That's what God desires of us. Not the result, but the daily walk. And remember the result of all of these things. When these things happen in scripture, what is the result of the Syrophoenician woman's daughter? Healing and freedom. What is the result of the guys who lower their friend on the mat, healing and forgiveness of sin and freedom? What is the result of all the people who come to Jesus with humility in their hearts, seeking a healing, seeing with faith in their hearts, they're set free. That's what God wants for us as disciples, to know that the good news is good news for all and that there is plenty, like this analogy with the food and the dogs and the children, there's plenty for all of us in the kingdom of God. For the Jew, for the Gentile, for high, low. We're all here together. So my hope and my prayer for you and for us is that we would think about these things and, and, and never, never be afraid to press into Jesus for the desires of your heart. Would you pray with me? God, thank you. God, thank you for this woman and her great faith. Father, I pray that we would learn from her. I pray that we would be inspired by her. I pray that we would acknowledge that you have everything that we need, God, that you are enough. That you're enough to heal that relationship. You're enough to answer that question. God, you're enough to repair that which seems irreparable. And Lord, we know that whether you do it or not, and if it's on our hearts, Lord, we will bring it to you. Give us the courage to live like this, God. To trust you with all things even the things we sometimes give up on. Remind us of those things, God. Remind us of the desires of our hearts that we've tried to hide, that we've tried to ignore. Allow us to be honest with you. Thank you, Lord, for calling us. Thank you, Lord, for welcoming us. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.